Firstly, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is a roundtable um, about Britain's arable flora. My name is Kath Shelswell and I work for Plant Life. I've been working on arable plants for 11 and a half years across England and Wales, and I currently oversee an England-wide project called Colour in the Margins. In this roundtable will explore the role that arable plant communities have within the farm landscape. What kind of habitat and resources do they provide for other farmland wildlife? And what value do arable plants have to benefit agricultural production, such as, such as integrated pest management? We will also expand on the impacts of problem plants and reducing the impact of undesirable problem weeds. Finally, what is our cultural heritage linked to arable plants? And is there the beginnings of new cultural heritage with cornfield flowers being used as part of urban sowing programmes and an increase in awareness with more people holidaying at home? We have an absolutely fantastic panel today and I'll let them all introduce themselves uh, in, in shortly. Um, the format of the round table is that the panel have been asked some questions already and are poised to answer them. We'll then have a question and answer session. So please do put your questions into the Q&A. Try using the Q&A rather than the chat function because that's the one that we're monitoring. If someone has asked a question that you feel is very relevant, you can upvote it by clicking on the like button to the side of it. This moves the question up the list and means that it's easier to find, especially if we have a lot of questions. So we really do want your input here. Before I introduce the panel, I would like to set the scene about arable plants. So humans have been farming in the UK for at least six and a half thousand years. Traditionally grazed habitats like heathland and grassland may have already existed, already existed in forest clearings, exposed hilltops or coastal heathland headlands, but others such as arable fields, hedgerows and orchards were created by people. Arable farmland may not be considered as natural as other habitats, but its importance for wildlife should not be understated. The colourful hues of cornfield flowers were once a familiar part of our arable landscape, but sadly they are now the fastest declining suite of plants in the UK. They are often overlooked and can be threatened by the arable farming on which they depend. So there's this push and pull situation that they are absolutely tied to the mechanics of arable farming. The decline in arable plants originates from many sources, such as historically the introduction of seed cleaning, herbicides and fertilisers, and more recently changes such as the conversion of less productive arable land to grass lays and changes in uh, depth of cultivation from ploughing to minimal or no tillage. But the decline of arable plants has a knock-on effect for other wildlife, such as invertebrates, bats and birds. Many farms across the country and all the organisations at this round table have taken up the mantle for arable plants. In 2018, the Back from the Brink partnership started with 19 um, individual projects across England and is funded by the National Heritage Lottery Fund. It's one of the most ambitious conservation programmes ever launched in England, trying to save 12 species from extreme threat of extinction and benefit a further 200. The Colour in the Margins project is one of the larger integrated programmes of work and focuses on arable farmland with a particular interest on 10 threatened arable plants and three rare ground beetles. There are two main delivery partners, Plant Life and the RSPB, and we work with a number of other organisations, including FWAG, Game Wildlife Conservation Trust, the Wildlife Trust, Natural England and the National Trust, as well as independent farm advisors and ecologists, and of course, many farmers and land managers across the country. Now that I've set the scene, I'd like to ask the panel to introduce themselves and also answer the question, what benefits do you see for other wildlife by encouraging arable plants? If we could start with Phil, first of all, please. I've unmuted myself, it's amazing. Isn't it? um, all right, I'm Phil Wilson and I've been working on arable plants for far too long. Um, initially with uh, the NCC in about oh, 1985, I think, then moving on to doing my PhD with the Game Conservancy in 87, postdoctoral work with them, and struggling to try and get them on the agenda ever since. Um, so, do you want me to answer the question first, or we just move on to the next person? I think if you could answer the question as you introduce yourself, that would be brilliant. Right, okay, well, um, what benefits do I see for other wildlife? I think it's the wrong question to ask, really. Um, I don't think we ought to be trying to justify conservation of one particular group of organisms by referring to another one. 
they have a value of their own. Um, they're beautiful plants and have a place in the countryside. And of course, we'll get on, I think, in a minute to discuss what benefits <coughs> this benefits they have in the countryside and to other organisms, but they have, they have, they have, they have their own value. Um, they're part of a natural system, of course, and part of trophic webs and all sorts of things. So they're, they're, they're food for other organisms. Um, but, but yeah, they're, they're, they're great things in themselves. So on to the next. Thank you, Phil. Um, Jess Brooks, um, please could you introduce yourself and answer the question, what benefits do you see for other wildlife by encouraging arable plants? Thanks, Kath. So yeah, uh, my name's Jess Brooks. I'm a farmland biodiversity advisor at the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, uh, which is a research charity that's done a wealth of research on farmland ecology over the last few decades. Um, I'm a facilitator of two farmer cluster groups, including the Martin Down Farm Cluster in Dorset and Hampshire, um, which is a nationally important area for arable flora. And I've loved getting to, to know these plants um, and advise on them and, and help farmers to troubleshoot. Um, so my answer to that question, because I'm with the GWCT, would obviously be about farmland birds. And we've done decades of research um, on the decline of wild grey partridges in particular as an indicator for <clears throat> hundreds of other farmland birds. And, and we've identified that these arable plants are a crucial part of that, that food chain because they house the insects that the chicks need to survive in the first few weeks. So that would be my answer. Thanks, Jess. That's great. Um, Ed Cross, um, what do you see uh, the benefits for other wildlife by encouraging arable plants? Uh, hello, I'm Ed Cross. I'm a farmer from West Norfolk. I farm uh, chalky and sandy soil. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm fortunate in that respect because there, there are quite a lot of interesting arable plants in this area of the country. And I, I see lots of benefits to other wildlife. Um, there are, for instance, turtle doves, one of their favourite foods is an uh, arable plant called humic tree. Uh, and if, if we can get plenty of humic tree growing, we stand a lot more chance of um, getting turtle doves uh, breeding on the farm. Um, and then in overwintered stubbles, the um, leaves of uh, some quite common arable plants are important for things like skylark. Uh, and there are also quite specific examples. Uh, there's a plant grows in this area uh, called flixweed that's got two quite rare insects on it. Um, there's a, uh, I think it's a leaf beetle and also grey carpet moth. Um, and uh, I, I check flixweed for that each year. I haven't found it yet, but um, uh, so, so some, some arable weeds will, will support some quite rare invertebrates. Thank you. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, Henry Lang, what do you feel the benefits um, are for other wildlife by encouraging arable plants? Sorry, Henry, I don't think we can hear you. Right, sorry about that, guys. Not very tech savvy. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an arable farmer um, down in spuddling around, around the Somerset levels and uh, about 800 conventional acres. Um, we've, uh, it's not ideal um, ground, it's very heavy ground, very difficult ground for rare arable plants, lots of problems with pernicious weeds and what have you, um, but we, we've, we've, uh, we have a go. Um, just to answer your, your question, I, I'd just like to go back to when I was a very small, small boy in the early 60s, I remember the grain pit being, being um, the grain being tipped into the grain pit for the corn dryer and it was full of, well, we used to call them weeds in those days. I still think probably do call them weeds. They were full of weeds and they were absolutely full of insects as well. And I remember the wasps coming down and picking up the injured insects and taking them away. It's all stuck in my mind. Today, I tip it out. There's nothing there but wheat. That is the difference. And obviously those insects, as Jess said, were food for many different species. Wow. Wow. Um... Amazing sites, and it was amazing. it's very um, today. It's very similar. When I brush harvest the meadows, we've got a lot of wildflower meadows. They they look very much the same. They're moving. That's the difference. Fantastic. So, uh, 
Emily Swan, um, what are the benefits that you see for other wildlife by encouraging arable plants? Thanks, Kath. Um, my name's Emily Swan and I'm a lead advisor in land management and conservation for Natural England, um, based over here in Norfolk. Um, and I'm also leading for Natural England nationally on arable plant conservation. Um, I think it's fair to say that anyone who knows me, and there are possibly several people on the, on the panel today who do, knows that I find arable plants and arable margins really, really quite exciting. Um, I think because they're so, so variable, you never really know what you're going to find when you go out from one month to the next, from one year to the next. You never do quite know. And I think they always, they always surprise. Last year, and I've been looking at arable margins now for about 17 years, last year I found a perfect nest of skylark chicks in a cultivated margin. Um, and it was just really something special. So others have gone into the sort of additional benefits, but I think it's that excitement of never quite knowing what you're going to find that keeps people looking and keeps you interested and you, and you have to observe and you have to keep going. And, and I think if you can get excited about something like that, whether it starts with arable plants and moves on to something else, or whether you just you know, happen to get really stuck into arable plants, I think it's having that ability to leave your mind open to look at the natural world around you that can have massive knock-on benefits for all sorts of wildlife. Wow, that's great. Um, and uh, last but not least at all, um, David Ward, what are the, uh, please introduce yourself and what are the benefits that you see for other wildlife by encouraging arable plants? Uh, thanks, Kath. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is David Ward, and I'm also um, an agricultural land management advisor in Norfolk um, with an agronomy background and probably spent, I'm slightly embarrassed to say, too many years using herbicides, which um, probably control too many uh, arable plants or weeds, as we used to call them. Um, in terms of benefits, I suppose I am involved with, there's two points really. One is I'm involved with a site in Hertfordshire which is dominated by cornflowers and I am astounded by the, the quantity of skylarks in, in just one field and, and bumblebees as well. It's just heaving, buzzing literally with, uh, uh, with bumblebees in particular. And the other point I just make at this, um, at this juncture is that um, if I go onto a farm um, and promoting agri environment and criticised stewardship, et cetera. If I'm honest, fallow plants, cultivated margins, low input seals probably isn't the top priority of landowners, farm, farmers. But I always think that, and we've just heard about them, all the benefits, all the environmental boxes that this option or these options tick is, is if I'm honest, a lot more than a lot of other options we promote. So um, yeah, there's lots of benefits often not recognised by uh, farmers or landowners, but um, it's, I'd always try and encourage farmers to have a go with this, this option because it's, yeah, it's, it's, it has lots of benefit. Thank you. Fantastic. So we've uh, got a series of, of questions which everyone has prepared answers for already. <laughs> um, uh, please do ask uh, your questions, use the Q&A function. You should be able to write a question in there and we will get to them um, uh, very soon. So, and it would be lovely to hear, you know, what you would like to find out about. We have a real group of experts here. So uh, make, make the best use of them really. Um, so the first question that I would like to ask um, Phil, is does the arable plant community support invertebrates that may provide, oh, sorry, Jess, um, uh, does the arable plant community support invertebrates that may provide pest control? Thanks, Kath. Um, the short answer is, is yes, they do. Um, what we normally think of when we think of um, crop pest predators is things like tusky grass and, and beetle banks, which are very important, uh, but they're more for sort of overwintering and shelter. It's the arable weeds themselves um, and that canopy and that microclimate that they provide in the field edge that are the really important part um, of, of the life cycle of these beneficial predators. Um, so, you know, they'll be offering shelter and food for things like ground beetles and ladybirds. Um, and to give examples, um, 
think of a hoverfly that is attracted to um, the nectar and pollen of a plant like, say, stinking chamomile. Um, the hoverflies will lay eggs, which turn into predatory larvae, which then eat um, crop pests like aphids. So it's really thinking about all life, sta all life cycle stages um, of these insects and of these plants, and they all tie together in, in a process that really works for us and the farmers. Great, uh, that, that's fantastic. Um, uh, so, um, Phil, how do arable plant communities change across the UK and are there differences in genetics? Oh, that's better. Um, <coughs> Yes, the plant communities very much change across the UK. In fact, they change across the whole of the whole of Europe. Um, so you can start you know, in the far in the Far East and um, Eastern Europe, you know, Ukraine, Turkey, Greece, and they're totally different to what we see here. Um, but as you go gradually through Eastern Europe to Central Europe into Germany, you, um, things but the, the climate, um, that's what it's all down to really, becomes gradually more and more Atlantic. The rainfall gets heavier in the winter, the summers get cooler, and the plants that form plant communities gradually change. Um, and because of that, I think in Britain, on the western fringe of, of Europe, we have a very, very interesting assemblage of, of plants, um, which is actually unique in, in, in the whole of Europe. So it's very much the, the western end of this continuum of change. Um, <clears throat> but what we see in Britain also reflects the sort of Mediterranean part of our flora as well, because we don't tend to have the very cold winters that they have further east in Europe. So we have a bit of a mixture of the two. So we actually have a very interesting, um, an interesting arable flora. And I think for that reason alone, we have, we have a, a, quite a, an obligation to do something about conserving it. Um, so genetics, uh, well, I think Kat's going to say something about that, but I think somebody had actually asked, asked a question in the Q&A section about genetics. Um, yeah, it's my... about cornflower, Phil. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, the, yeah. Here, here we go. Is there any way of finding out whether cornflower uh, population is a native strain and DA, DNA testing maybe? Well, the first thing I want to say is that I don't think anybody's ever really looked. Um, there's been... I think that, that uh, our technology for looking at DNA structuring in natural plant populations that has improved massively over the last 20 years or so. As far as I'm aware, and, and you can contradict me if you like, because um, I may not know, um, nobody has ever really looked at the structure of arable plant populations in Britain. I know I was involved with the project got over 20 years ago now, very fairly primitive technology, and somebody grew on um, vast numbers of seedlings from known populations to try and compare the gen genetics of them, and they were all stolen. So that, that project has stopped in its tracks. I'm not sure anybody's done any more, uh, more since then. But I think it's a very fruitful area of, of um, investigation. I mean, the techniques of DNA, um, DNA barcoding, DNA sequencing have become very, very cheap these days. So, you know, if somebody out there wants to fund some work on um, yeah, looking looking at the, the, the genetic structure of, of plant populations in, in Britain and indeed across the whole of Europe, I, I'd be really, really interested in having something to do with it. Um, yeah, cornflower, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one actually because it's been so widely introduced um, over the years. It's a popular garden plant. Uh, it's, well, we'll get on to this at the very end, I think, as well, but it's also a critically endangered rare native species as well. How do we tell the two populations apart? And it's very difficult. I think as soon as you see a pink corn flower in a field, you're probably fairly certain it's not a native one. But there are certainly areas in Britain where there are clusters of cornflower sites. So the one that David was talking about, I think is part of that. Is it the one just to the north of, of the N25 near South Mims? You can wave at me if it is. Hertfordshire? Yes, yeah, that's exactly the one, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually, there's a, there's a cluster of cornflower sites around there. So it occurs at Rothamsted, 
um, the Agricultural Experimental Station as what we think is a native population. And there are also several other records around there. Um, so there's obviously a, a, a cluster of, of um, native sites in that area. There are a few others in the country as well. Up in Northern Scotland, there's a group of sites as well. There's, there's uh, also I, a group in Wales, in Monmouthshire, yeah. uh, and another group in South um, uh, Ceredigion as well. Yeah, and there are some along the South Devon coast. So I think we can be fairly confident that those are native populations. We could use those as a basis for comparison. Um, so if we take those as being what we think are native populations, then we have a look at other populations in relation to those. We could probably get some re a really good handle on, on, on this. Um, but as I say, we don't really know yet. If only we did. So Kath, tell us about red hen nettle. Yes, yeah, so, so um, I was going to be, bring up an example of, of red hemp nettle, because uh, as part of the Colour in the Margins project, we've been uh, actively reintroducing certain very rare species, um, of which red hemp nettle is one of them. And uh, we've been working very closely with um, Q Millennium Sea Bank to do this, uh, and they've been absolutely fantastic, and they uh, had some seed from the Cotswolds population red hemp nettle. By red hemp, uh, you know, there, there are probably fewer than 30 populations in the country uh, and, and probably fewer than that even, and certainly not that many on arable land. And the Cotswold population comes from Cleve Common. It's actually on Scree. It's another habitat that that species grows on. It, um, and Q grow on uh, a lot of, of plants, they managed to harvest a lot of um, seed for us that we could reintroduce that elsewhere, but they brought a couple of plants along with them to something and sh showed them to me and, and my colleague, um, uh, Elizabeth Cook, and we had a look at it and we went, that's not red hemp nettle. It just doesn't look like it. And the flowers are tiny, the leaves are quite broad. The other name for red hemp nettle is fear leaf hemp nettle. So we started to really wonder if there had been some kind of contamination. Q took away some of the, you know, they took the plants away and they sent it off to the species expert uh, who was able to confirm that it was absolutely definitely red hemp nettle, which is fantastic. According to the physical characteristics, it's at the lower edge of its range for um, the size of flower. Um, and it's also got very broad leaves compared to other red hemp nettle populations. Um, but it did mean that we had to look at our um, reintroduction protocols again. And uh, for that particular lot of seed, we decided that we could only reintroduce it into the Cotswolds. I mean, we try not to take seed across the country anyway because of local varieties and the possibilities. The uh, next thing we decided to do with Q's help was to take lots of tissue samples from populations around the country, which are currently sitting in the Millennium Seed Bank, uh, pretty frozen. Um, and uh, waiting for DNA testing. Unfortunately, it's got stuck at that point because that testing will cost probably 10 to 20,000 pounds because of the equipment that you have to use. And it's just beyond anyone's uh, funding at the moment. So if there's a nice funder out there who would like to do that, then uh, we might be able to line it up for a student to do as soon as students go back after the current COVID crisis. Um, Interestingly, since we found that out, we have done some reintroductions of that seed, red hemp nettle, and within those reintroduced populations, we have very uh, normal, uh, what we would expect for red hemp nettle plants coming up. We also have very squat, small flowered, broad leaved red hemp nettle um, plants that have come up as well. And there's a real divergence in characteristic in that single population from the Cotswolds. It's the only one in the Cotswolds. And so it's the only one it could have come from. So it's just an interesting case that, you know, should we be taking seed across the country? And I think that has kind of clarified to us really that we need to be really careful about this. And we also need to look at local genetics and local populations, and we just don't know enough at the moment. Um, I'm going to stop there and ask the next question, um, which, uh, and this is, is to David, first of all, and then to Henry, and I've just noticed in the Q&A, Henry, you've been asked this question specifically by someone else as well, um, uh, to do with your heavy land. Uh, so can desirable uh, kind of rare and threatened arable plants, like red hemp nettle or corn buttercup, 
uh, be encouraged without problem plants like black grass, wild oat and perennial sow thistle. Okay, would you like me to answer that one now? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it's um, it's really quite difficult with our heavy land. Um, it's never going to be, I don't think it's ever going to be on a large scale. Uh, what we've got is little corners and margins. We almost micromanage them because in the past, uh, many years ago, you may have heard of conservation headlands. Uh, the Game Conservancy in those days, as it was called, um, were, were developing these, these conservation headlands. We tried them about 20 years ago and lost control. And there were cleavers, black grass, it was a real problem. So what we do now is we, we've I've targeted small areas on the farm to manage. And what we sometimes do is, is mix, uh, go to a spring cultivation, which helps on the black grass and the, on the cle black grass and cleavers. Uh, if there's not too much black grass or cleavers there, we'll, we'll go in and try and get some autumn germinators. Like we, we've, we've got a lot of shepherd's needle at the moment. In fact, we've got one field or one corner of the field and there's so much shepherd's needle, you cannot see any ground. And we've also tried to get spreading hedge parsley into that area. So it's not the pernicious weeds a problem, it's the, spread, it's the shepherd's needle in this instance, which is obviously a, a rare arable plant. I was about um, to say that's at the moment, the shepherd's needle is critically endangered as well. So it's, it's yeah, quite not an unusual fact. It's literally, it is totally green and it's crowding everything else out. So we're a bit concerned. Um, Alison, Alison uh, planted a lot of spreading hedge parsley, and I'm not too sure if it's going to make it because it's going to be competed out. Um, so, but yeah, but going back to the black grass and things, it is a problem. What we tend to do in the in the second year when it goes back in, we're in on a stewardship rotation. In the second year, when it's into an arable plant, normally winter wheat, um, I'm very often the sprayer operator. My brother is. I will put some sticks in where the best populations were the year before of the plant we want. I'll stick some sticks in, he'll leave the, flip the sprayer off on that little section and then I'll micromanage that section if needs be our hand rogue or I've even used a hoe occasionally. So then you've got the population then for the following year um, when you go back into a into an arable cultivation um, stewardship uh, plot. So that seems to work quite well but I can never see us doing broad acres on our heavy clay. Um, I'm just trying to pick well, help, with the help of you guys, guidance of you guys, trying to pick a few variety, a few species which are, which are critically endangered or endangered or rare, and just try and home in on those and just do, do my little bit in, in this part of Somerset. That's great. And David, more generally then, how, you know, it's, it's a massive problem, isn't it? We want to encourage some species that we term desirable, apart from maybe shepherd's needle. <laughs> As it sounds like um but you know by encouraging those we do get black grass world oak perennial sow thistle and a number of other things coming up which are real agronomic weed problems um, they are and that can be a natural consequence but it's you know the problems aren't insurmountable so at the risk of stating the obvious tr try and choose a site that isn't full of black grass or sterile bro or, or cleavers or whatever um I'd also try and choose, if you have it, Henry obviously doesn't, but the lighter, higher pH, nutrient poor soils, um, tends to have more of the arable plants that we perhaps after, but having said that, you know, corn, buttercups, spreading hedge parsley will be found probably on the heavier soils anyway, so that's not, not, it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, unless a specific, you've got a specific location for a plant that you're targeting, then don't forget with the low input cereal options and the AB11 um, fallow plant, you can move them around the farm. So choose different options after two or three years, if things are becoming a problem, then, then move them. Um, I understand that, well, I believe that you can, you know, have a break. So whether it be one, possibly two years, I'll let Phil perhaps come in on this. How long can you go by having a break before the seed bank starts to uh, deplete seriously? Um, but certainly moving them around. Spring cultivation versus autumn, AB11, you can do both, but if, you, if you're having a problem and it's not specifically autumn germinating plant, then you can go to a, a spring cultivation and you know, do a stale seed bed or even use a non-selected herbicide. Um, varying the cultivation depth of, of, of your cultivations. So, so having periodic plowing helps with the black grass anyway. Um, 
And as Henry's mentioned, within AB11, you can do spot treatment, not saying it's the best job in the world, and wouldn't like to do extensive areas, but you can do it. And I have used personally in the past uh, contact acting gluminocytes, which I can't use too often because of uh, resi uh, resistance. And actually, I won't go into it now, but I think that's off the table. That, you, that option is gone. Um, if anybody wants to pick up on it later, I'll come back to it. But that, that's, um, I have used it in the past, but probably not in the future. And I would say, just lastly, that don't despair too much if you do have problems, because I can't explain it, but they do change each year. So one year, you may have wild oats and mugwort a problem, and even if you don't do too much to try and alleviate it, they seem to change. The problem becomes less. I know it sounds odd, but I've seen it so many times where it's, it's not what you expect. But um, so don't, yeah, don't despair and keep the faith and keep going. That's brilliant. So um, uh, I suppose leading on from that, um, and Phil, when does a problem plant maybe become useful like thistles? Uh, following up on what David was just, just saying about how long can you leave breaks in between, uh, well, how long larable plants survive if, they're not, if they don't produce seed, will they come up again? Um, it varies from species to species very much. Yeah, so some plants have seed dormancies that will go on for, for decades. Others are much, much more, much, much shorter lived in the soil. Um, I mean, corn cockle is the most extreme one. It hardly has a seed, seed bank in the soil at all. Um, corn buttercup doesn't last for very long either. So it depends on the species. If you're dealing with corn buttercup, for instance, it's good to have plants flowering every year, every, every other year at least. Um, other things can survive for a lot longer. Um, yeah, and, and shepherd's needle. My God, I, you know, I've, I've, I've seen fields that are just one side to the other, solid with it. Why it's critically endangered, I've got absolutely no idea at all. Um, in a lot of the country, it is extremely rare, but there are some places that, on the heavy soils in East Anglia, uh, yeah, you, you, can, you can harvest it and sell it for hay or something. Um, yeah, so, so when, when does the problem plant become useful? Um, again, you know, useful, what is useful? But um, certainly if, if you want to talk about um, you know, value to invertebrate populations and field margins. Um, unfortunately, the, the most useful things there seem to be composites. So thistles and south, south thistles seem to be the things that are most attracted to the largest number of invertebrate species, unfortunately. Um, so there's a bit of a paradox there. We have to try and um, reach a balance between what's good for invertebrates and what's good for the arable plants. But obviously, you know, we want to keep things like thistles and perennial south thistles under control. But if you get rid of them completely, we could well be um, diminishing the value of field margin for invertebrates. Um, I think there's some work being done fairly recently. Uh, I think the Game and Wildlife Trust were involved with this, um, looking at actually what the best sort of seed mixture in a field margin would be. Um, and the conventional ones that recommend um, lots of uh, legumes, clovers, and similar in field margins actually weren't terribly good, but the best things were things that included composites. So, yeah, south thistle-like species, um, geranium family, and field bindweed. Seems so about the best thing for pollinating insects. So I think it's going to be a bit, bit of rethinking about exactly what we are really wanting out of field margins. So obviously we want rare arable plants, but also we want things that are valuable to invertebrates as well. It's a big paradox. How we get there, I'm not altogether sure. Um, you know, on a similar subject, I think CEH was supposed to be coming up with, with a whole panoply of solutions for these problems. I mean, they started the project back in about 2010. I've not seen any results of it yet. I thought it should have got through the, the morass of, of DEFRA proofreading by now. Um, so hopefully something will come out of that. Um, in, in ways in which we can fine tune management of the field margins to try and achieve the maximum benefit for the maximum number of organisms. You know, I'm an arable plant specialist, but I also see the value in other things as well. Um, so, yeah, problem plants can be useful, um, but just not too many of them. Yeah. Um, em, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to come on in quickly on this question as well? 
yeah it was just a very quick one um something that one of the farmers that i look after um on his arable margins said to me once and he said um and i quote almost word for word i don't know why people are frightened of this option because you don't tell me what i can do in the middle of my crop and i think because he keeps his margins in one place year on year doesn't really matter what comes up good or bad because i'm not telling him what to do with the barley or the sugar beet or the whatever's next to it and so i think you know it's just just something really that to bear in mind these things are rare because we have developed methods of controlling them and that is still there um if we need to uh if they do become out of control but i would say perhaps we should flip the question on its head and just think about when does it actually become a problem? I mean, is it actually a problem or is it just a perceived problem that, that we have historically with it? So I, I think, I think Henry, you've obviously had some real life issues and obviously you have had some problems there and I'm sure many, many others will have done too. But I think, you know, a lot of the annual species that we're after um, conserving they will benefit from the, the pollinators that are attracted into those margins by the more common and possibly less desirable species. Because um, there's no good having a nice low growing sward of really scarce species if there's no pollinators to complete their life cycle. So um, don't, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. That, that's brilliant. Um, so I've got a couple of questions on um, uh, agri-environment which have also come up in the chat. But then there's another kind of question which is related to it from the chat, from the Q&A, which I'm going to ask as well. So um, I'll follow that, that after the agri-environment schemes because it's related. So um, I suppose uh, Emily and then Jess, um, have agri-environment schemes been beneficial for arable plant communities in the past and which measures were the most successful? Okay, um, so there's a long answer and a short answer. I think we've only got time for the short one. Essentially, um, people like GWCT, CEH, excellent ecologists like Phil and many more have done a lot of studies over the years, which have proven that when done well, arable plant specific options do deliver for scarce and declining arable plants. Um, I'm not going to go into a literature review right now, but there's plenty out there if you want to follow that up. What I can talk about just briefly is the concept of um, what doing well looks like and, and the kind of uptake of those scheme options. Because it's all very well knowing that something works very well, but if no one's actually doing it, it's rather beside the point. Um, and I think regardless of schemes almost, because a great many people do things voluntary, the key thing when trying to conserve arable annual plants is by providing that annually cultivated ground every year and allowing it to, to be retained throughout the summer so the plants can fully complete their life cycle. Um, now, if we're thinking in modern scheme language, that's gonna be best achieved through option AB11 which is the cultivated margin option. And as Kath said, and I think others have said previously, you know, your first year will look very different from years to come, but almost instantly in the first year, you will have a diverse sward of something. Um, some of you may have done this and had a not very diverse sward of very um, nutrient tolerant species like fat hen, um, but I have seen people push on through that and actually end up with a really nice, diverse, structurally interesting sward. Um, so first of all, I would say the key thing with agri-environment really is, is the specific options which are designed for arable plants, the cultivated uncropped headlands, the um, conservation headlands, historically, perhaps to a lesser extent these days, because they're slightly more complex. You know, those arable plant options are really great. Some of the more permanent options, options um, where you introduce floristic perennial species or, or grass tussocky species, great to have a mix, but anything that's going to take that annual cultivation out is going to be something you want to avoid. Because I've, I've had people come to me often say, well, I have plenty of bare ground, 
but bare ground and cultivated ground is not necessarily the same thing for this suite of species. Um, in terms of where I've seen it be really successful through agri-environment, I mean, where you've got a range of options available to you, it's about selecting the right option and, and knowing what you're trying to achieve. So if you want that, if you want that annual flora flowering year round, you know, you need to be looking at those cultivated options. Um, I think it's an interesting one in terms of uptake because conserving weeds, I, I like to refer to them as plants these days, um, is, is not a natural progressive step for most farmers. Um, it's mainly been their life's work to try and reduce the numbers of weeds. Um, and you, David Ward, and you. Um, but good accessible advice and enthusiasm and engagement with, with straightforward options, I think can actually make it feasible. And I'm, I'm pleased to see you nodding there as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's very much me coming from an advice perspective. I don't know if you've got anything, anything in there, Jess, have you? I was just going to say, so Jess, do you have some examples from, you know, from your farm clusters that you could add? Yeah, I'll just um, comment on a couple of the options that, that we've used in the area. Um, number one being these annual cultivated margins and plots, the AB11s on the countryside stewardship, um, which stay on the same site and, and are only generally rotated if, if absolutely necessary to control pernicious weeds. And the reason why I say absolutely necessary is because there is some new GWCT evidence to say that managing sites in the same place results in better ecology, um, i.e. more flowers, more bees, etc. Um, plus, anecdotally, in, in the Martin Down Farmer Cluster, we, we had a, a nice margin which we discovered night flowering catch fly on. Um, in the first year, we had a handful, second year, 30, and this year we had, last year, we had just under a thousand. Um, and that's in three years, thanks to that option. Um, but, you know, obviously, as others have said, it these these habitats must be able to be incorporated into the farm and the rotation to control weeds. Um, also, just briefly about wild bird seed mixtures and game cover crops, um, which can be fantastic because they are regularly cultivated, um, low input environments that give plants that crucial opportunity to uh, complete their whole life cycle, whilst playing another role on the farm for other things as well. So it's a win win. Uh, and and this one really leads leads on to it and I, I'm going to ask Ed first and then um, Henry so how can farmers be encouraged to adopt arable plant options because you know we've heard different ways of or, um, different options that can be done and it would be just nice to hear some real life examples of what you've been able to do on your farms. Uh, well I, I think uh, reliable um, payments that, that are um, high enough to uh, encourage farmers to, to take up uh, the, some of the options that we've been talking about. I, I think good advisory support is, is really helpful. Um, and I, I think having people come on the farm who have the skills to uh, identify plants and uh, tell farmers, me included, what they've got. I think that can be uh, very motivating to know that you've got some interesting plants. It gives you an incentive to try and, and conserve them. Fantastic. Henry, how, how, how do you feel about the options and, and um, the scheme in particular? Because I know that you might do some stuff on a voluntary side, but uh, we'll stick with the scheme. Yeah, I think it, the main thing is try and keep it simple and flexible and really engage the farmers um, as Ed was saying if you can get enthusiasts onto your farm who can enthuse about the arable plants you're going to sweep people with you everybody loves an enthusiast and I think that's to get the farmers really engaged and enthusiastic is, is probably more important than the financial part um, but as Ed said um, our, um, our payments on, on stewardship have been all over the place and, and stop and go and it's been very difficult to uh, to plan financially and um, yeah we've just got to make it make it fit in it's got to be flexible that's the main thing. Fantastic I, I'm actually going to ask one from the chat now partly because we're getting a little bit pushed for time I think we're going to run over <laughs> seven o'clock slightly so um, uh, the question that it's got a lot of um, uh, voting up 
so there's a general shift from plan to minimal tillage across the country, and some of this is, is for soil carbon. Uh, what impacts do you think this will have on arable plants? And um, this is really relevant. In fact, I was discussing it with this person today because uh, she's part of my team. And um, it's, it's to do with the AB11 cultivated margins of plots option, because actually it doesn't state ploughing and cultivation. And so minimum tillage, and this has a direct, can have a direct effect on some of the arable plants. So um, I suppose, um, Phil, if we could go to you first of all for, um, you know, what is, is there an effect on different arable plants in terms of depth of cultivation? And then Ed and Henry, if you would like to chip in in terms of depth of cultivation and have you found any different effects for different arable plants? If you can't answer it, that's okay. Phil, take it away. Well, I think so far I'm, I'm not aware of any proper scientific studies looking at um, the effects of minimum tillage versus conventional ploughing. Um, I, I, you know, something I'd really like to do if you if you can if you want to compare and contrast two methods in sufficiently number of, sufficient number of replicated sites. I think that'll be wonderful. My my general impression is that, and I have a feeling that people might possibly agree with me that that what we see with minimum tillage is a gradual buildup of um, perennial species and grass weeds, in particular bromus species, um, and a gradual decrease of annuals and particular ones we're actually interested in. I, I, I don't think that minimum tools is a particularly good thing for rare arable annuals. I may be wrong. I'd like to do the science. I'd like to see the science to actually put, put some numbers to that. Um, but they, they, these, these are my, my personal observations, nothing more, nothing more than that, really. Um, I mean, one possible option, if, if, if minimum tillage is actually being detrimental to populations of rare arable, arable species and increasing weed burdens in field margins, is well, it's difficult actually because an awful lot of farmers have actually sold their plows off now, don't actually have the equipment anymore. Um, but to go round field margins maybe once every four or five years with a plow for grass weed control and to try and regenerate the annual seed bank, maybe that would be an option that, that, would, that would combine the two things. Now, in, in terms of carbon storage, well, uh, and also I suppose actually the amount of carbon the amount of fossil fuels that actually gets used in seabed preparation as well, very much reduced with minimum tillage. You know, that, that, that can't be argued against, um, but it may be detrimental to populations of arable plants and maybe increasing weed burdens as well. Um, there can also be uh, an increased use of herbicide as well for minimum tillage. Yeah, 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 so, yes, very much so. Ed or Henry, would either of you like to jump in with some experience on this, this question? Go for Ed. Sorry, a bit slow on unmuting there. Sorry, it's Henry here. Yep. Um, no, we've. Uh, of course, you can. Um, you can use a, a duck foot cultivator to the same depth you would a plow. So, I know a plow does invert the soil totally. So, you'd pop, if, if you're if you can plow at a good depth, you can bury the, the 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 green matter on top. Well, that is great. We've never actually plowed historically. Never plowed any deeper than about five inches anyway on this heavy clay. So actually, you could use a, a cultivator down to that depth if, if you needed to. Um, as you said, our, our plow was sold many years ago. It's in the stinging nettles for about 20 years. We've now sold it. So um, I don't know if Ed would like to say anything. Um, yeah, I, I'm uh, keen on uh, no-till for, for the reasons that Phil mentioned, hopefully some benefits on carbon sequestration and um, maybe a bit more drought resilience on my sandy soils. Uh, I, I expect uh, in the main parts of the fields that's going to be bad for um, uh, arable plants but I'd hope to keep all the species that we've got by managing specific parts of particular margins we've got quite a, a wide network of the AB11 option that, that's been mentioned several times so I'd certainly hope to keep those going um, and I, but I, I think one one area that I, I don't know how it's going to go is uh, overwintered stubbles um, 
because on ground that's cultivated each year, some of those can be quite interesting and, and quite a good resource for, for uh, overwintering birds, but I'm not sure how they'll um, be affected by no-till. We're, um, uh, we are actually um, getting close to time. We can continue. Uh, we're not going to be kicked off, I've just found out. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, we said we would ca carry on for an hour and, and people might want a bit more of an evening. So we have some more questions to ask. We also have loads of questions in, in the Q&A. I'm going to jump a couple of the questions that uh, were prepared beforehand, because there's quite a bit um, about kind of urban situations and things like that. And I just wanted to, to go to that one just in case anyone did have to leave at seven o'clock and we can come back to some of the others and some of the Q&A, but hopefully this will answer some of the Q&A anyway. So, um, uh, and Phil, um, do you think that there is the beginnings of kind of a new cultural heritage um, with cornfield flowers being used as part, as part of planting displays in urban areas? And how do you think this might link people with their environment? Um, and we could come to you after, Phil, if, if you've got anything more to add. Well, I think there's actually a very old cultural heritage. I mean, after all, we've been uh, Homo Agricola for the last five or six thousand years in Britain. Um, so we've, we've been very, very, very closely associated with farming. I mean, 200 years ago, I, I'd been a peasant and I'd been out digging the fields and dealing with weeds intimately every day. Um, so I think that they are very much part of people's consciousness. I think if you went, went onto the street and asked an average person, um, you know, the, 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 what plants come to mind as native British species in the top three, I think you'd have bluebell, you'd probably have oak, and the third one would probably be the poppy, because it's intimately associated with commemoration of the war dead. If you go to France, um, you get the answer of the cornflower, because it has the same connections. Um, so I think I think these 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 cultural associations are there anyway. Um, you know, um, there's a, there's a story from about the 1930s. I think what one of the kings Edward or George or somebody uh, went on a royal visit to, to Cambridgeshire, and one of his courtiers asked whether the, the fields had been deliberately sown red, white, and blue for the occasion. But actually, it was cornflower, poppy, and mayweed. Um, so yeah, they're, they're part of our culture. So are they acquiring a new cultural significance as part of urban plantings? Well, I don't imagine most people even know what's being planted on road verges, as long as it's colourful. Um, you know, if you're going to try and raise awareness of these species, you need to do a bit more than just planting them. Um, and people need to know what they are. Um, I mean, I have great misgivings about widespread planting of native species in that sort of context anyway. Um, I think we've already mentioned the, the confusion between wild populations of cornflower and native populations. Um, so I, I have very mixed feelings about this. Uh, in some ways, I think it's quite good because you know, native species as plantings in urban situations are almost certainly kind of a greater benefit to invertebrate populations than planting non-native species. On the other hand, it gives an illusion of wildness that isn't really there at all. Um, and one also often finds you know, arable plant species being sold in packets as meadow mixes, you know, instant meadow. And of course, they're nothing of the sort. They'll last for a year and the grass will grow over and the person who's planted them will just be disappointed. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Planting displays in urban areas. Well, yeah, I say mi mixed feelings. Um, that's, that's... Good things in some ways, uh, but with, with, I think, philosophical implications in others. Now, are they fostering an, an illusion of wildness and contact with nature that's not really there at all? It's a difficult one to answer, isn't it? Um, I'm just going to go to M and ask you a slightly different variation on this that's been asked in the Q&A. Do you think that arable plants on road verges should be encouraged or discouraged? Arable plants on road verges. Now, there's an interesting one. Um, I think I I think I share many of Phil's concerns, to be honest, about this. Um, but, and I think as conservationists, 
um, we've got a bit of a a bit of a role, a bit of a responsibility, if you like, to um, make sure that we can try and make things like arable plants, like the use of wildflower seed mixes, you know, make things accessible and, and make things, you know, give, give people an awareness and an appreciation of these things, but, but in a way that's ecologically sound. Um, and I think as conservationists, we don't always strike that balance right necessarily. And I think quite often community based planting projects are perhaps um, not all the time, but sometimes they can be very well intended, but perhaps not well understood. So people sow annual mixes and they have a great riotous show of colour um, in the first year and then there's no subsequent cultivation or follow up and then they wonder why there's no subsequent show and riot of colour. Um, so I think, to be honest, by, by all means, do either, but let's work together to ensure that the awareness is there of what it is that we are creating. If we're creating perennial wildflower meadows that will persist in a meadow state and in a system of meadow management, then fantastic. And if we want to create a riotous display of colour and, and annual wonderfulness, um, because they are wonderful species, Let's understand where they come from and why they're there and perhaps what, what's going to happen to them. So, and I, I think also some of the work that, that Q have done with yourselves through Back From The Brink, there is potentially the opportunity there to consider using, and certainly it's something we're looking at in Norfolk this year, is to consider using actual native seeds of arable plant species in in a conservation setting, or potentially could we consider different settings? I don't know. There's a there's a question there. I think yeah, it's it's a really difficult situation. Certainly through the Colour in the Margins project, we have uh, it reintroduced populations of seed from six different uh, species, and they're the sites are very carefully chosen, looking at where the seed originally came from. You know, so uh, for corn buttercup. The seeds for that uh, came from Cambridgeshire and uh, Q did a grow out for us and we reintroduced it back into Cambridgeshire. Um, so we were being very, very careful um, about where, where it's gone. And uh, just, you know, we, we, there are protocols and there are things to think about to do that. And I can actually, you know, if anyone wants any more information, I can direct you to the uh, colour in the margins uh, web page and if you scroll down to the yellow download bar there are a lot of publications on there one of them is about um, things to think about so kind of good practice for reintroducing seed to the wild to farmland but we don't cover urban areas they're slightly different uh, in terms of the fact that it's 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 a very different type of community um, I'm going to jump back to a question, but add on to it because we've had a really good one in in the chat. And so, Jess, I really think this is a, a question for you. Are there conflicts in management between different groups of wildlife, for example, arable plants and pollinators, and how can these be overcome? I just want to add on to that that um, someone's asked. So, invertebrates only travel into the crop from cultivated areas by a certain distance. So, uh, is there any work on leaving the area between? Uh, the wheelings of a tram line cultivated um, and uh, would this be easy to manage and uh, would the crop benefit enough to warrant the loss of area so it's it's about kind of integrated pe pest control so a little bit about both okay um i'll i'll go with the conflicts one first um, i've got a really good example actually so i'll just hone in on that, seeing as we haven't got much time. Um, in one of my farmer cluster groups, we had um, a population of pheasant eye, which scores nine out of nine in terms of rarity. Um, and that appeared in a newly drilled perennial wildflower margin. Um, and a year later in the same wildflower margin, an uncommon bumblebee, the brown banded carder, was recorded as well. <laughs> um, so this pheasant eye conflict was, was reported um, straight away, but the, the RPA were unable to amend the scheme to the satisfaction of, of all parties. So it really only left the estate with the option of, of absorbing the, the cost of, of annual ploughing of a strip next to that flower margin to try and keep the best of both worlds. Um, and, and they kind of didn't want to 
to do that because it kind of sets a precedent um, that farmers shouldn't be paid for managing arable plants. Um, and this actually happened in the other one of my farmer cluster groups as well, almost the exact same scenario, but with um, finally tumetry uh, being the arable plant that was rare. And then we had breeding small blue butterflies, which are also extremely rare. <laughs> um, what are the chances of having two massive issues like that in, in two different cluster groups? Um, but in that case, um, the farm did, did nobly put in an unplowed, unpaid strip and it came up trumps, but not everyone is prepared to do that and, and nor, nor should they be. So I think when these conflicts do, do occur, the only ways I can think of to prevent them happening is, is to try and introduce as much monitoring as possible, um, review local historical records before stewardship work is implemented, but for those instances like we had where you get a big surprise, they crop up, it's too late. Um, you know, I think Helms scheme designers are going to have to make it easier for farmers to negotiate the reciting um, and also be paid for additional options to be put in to manage those plants where they where they do occur. So, yeah, that's that's that. Um, about the, the cultivating tram lines to encourage um, <clears throat> arable plants within tram lines, that's an interesting concept. I haven't thought of that before. Um, we tend to find that the best and most beneficial assemblages of um, arable plants tend to be on the edges of fields. Um, <clears throat> so that would be the first thing I'd say. I'm not sure you'd actually get a lot of uh, quality canopy and diversity of arable plants within the middle of a field just because they've been lost um, you know, over time. Um, but also, we know from research that generally beneficial predators go about 100 metres. Um, so if you were to go, if you were to put a, a reservoir of beneficial predators in every tram line, that might be overkill. Because <laughs> because they're only like, you know, 25, 30 metres apart, aren't they? But yeah, those are my just two thoughts on that. But you know, Ed or Henry might have further thoughts on that. So would Ed or Henry, would either of you like to jump in on that one as well? And uh, are there ways of introducing habitats within fields that may benefit uh, invertebrates and, and other, you know, and possibly arable plants, um, but even just, you know, common arable plants, which can provide a home for certain things? Um, uh, I, I, I think it, well, I've got experience of trying to introduce uh, arable plant strips within sugar beet crops. Uh, it's all connected with loss of neonicotinoids and trying to get more uh, beneficials actually into the crop. And um, as Jess said, um, uh, we, we didn't have them spaced very closely. They were 75 metres apart, roughly. And it, it, it can be quite it's surprisingly complex um and also um you've got to get the some of the timings right um so for instance we wanted to get the plants established before we drilled the sugar beet and that, 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 that's quite complex and, and i think um i personally find it I mean, we are persevering with that um because there is a potential benefit to the sugar beet crop but in general something like AB11 where you can really focus on this bit of land is for arable plants that's just a lot easier because you can you can really optimize it for, for arable plants in that space and you're, and you're not thinking about all the other crop management uh, things that you've got to do if you've got strips with, within a crop. Yeah, just to follow on from that, I, I, I reinforce that. It, it, they're going to come down to trying to keep things relatively simple. Um, I think Jess touched on it earlier on, actually. Uh, pollen, pollinating mixes, uh, nectar mixes, and also, well, we haven't really mentioned that much, uh, wild bird cover or game cover. That great opportunity as well for, for arable, arable plants. A lot of them are sort of two-year rotation, one or two-year rotations. And also, um, growing broadleaf, broadleaf um, arable crops. Uh, beans we, we grow winter beans and spring beans weed control is not always brilliant in especially in spring beans and quite a few of the rare arable arable plants get away from the herbicides so i think mixed cropping is also a, a great help so um i've got uh uh 
one question here, which kind of touches on on some of the um, kind of beneficial elements of, of some of the arable plants as well. So, um, Ed, can arable plants be of direct benefit to people, either in a nutrition, nu I can't say it, nutritional sense, uh, medicinal, or maybe just for enjoyment? Um, what do you think about that? Okay, well, well, I, I've just got really one one story on each. Um, uh, we had a plant that, um, well, st still have it actually, but um, a plant called Corn Gromwell, um, which I thought had died out on, on the farm. And I, I was searching on the internet to try and find out more about it to see if I could, I could get the management um, for it correct. And uh, I, I um, came across some people who were growing it commercially. And so I, I got in touch with them. And um, it, it's one of the richest plant sources of omega-3. So it's being used as a um, vegan source for, for, for uh, omega-3 oil. And uh, I, I think it, it just brought home to me um, how unpredictable some of the benefits of, uh, well, any plant, but arable plants included, because I, you know, looking at it when, when it um, uh, 10 years ago, I would never have thought that it could have had a, a significant um, uh, dietary uh, benefit. Um, and also an another thing about um, that is it, um, we've now rediscovered it on, on two sites on the farm. Uh, they're they're about, um, about half a mile apart. And the geneticist in this company that, that, that's growing corn Gromwell said that those two populations are probably genetically distinct because it only um, crosses at, at very close distance. And in terms of conserving the traits of um, uncommon plants that, that may be of, of benefit to us, um, I think it's important to conserve some of these rare plants in their original sites. And I mean, it's something Catherine, you were talking about the, the red hemp nettle in, I think it was the Cotswolds. Um, so so, so um, as well as trying to expand their ranges, I, I, I think as many of the original sites that can be identified and conserved, that, that then you, you may be conserving a, a valuable genetic resource. And, and in terms of enjoyment, um, about five miles away from here, uh, a few years back, there, there was a large arable reversion grassland creation scheme. Um, so arable land was taken out of production and so on with the wildflower mix but in that first year it's full of arable weeds and so there was in the region of 150 acres that ha happened to have a public road going right through the middle of it that was just red with poppies and it got onto social media here a lot and um, into the local papers and when I used to just go there and, and, and have a look at this there'd often be cars that just stop, you know, I don't imagine they, they, they might have come specially to see it, but it was so amazing. And uh, so I think you know, arable plants do have that capacity to, for that, for that one year to really change the countryside. And, and it just, uh, you know, it just kind of takes people out of whatever they were thinking about as they were driving along and wow, look at that, you know, it's just red. And uh, I think, I think that's sort of a, a great thing really. It's, it's, it's brilliant when you do see that, and I know that uh, certainly in Cornwall, uh, several, lots of people flood some of the arable fields there when they're out in flower because they're just absolutely stunning. Um, I'm going to go and answer, uh, ask some questions from the q and I'm going to pick some people from the panel, sorry, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, but if, if, you know, uh, feel free to put up your hand, uh, literally put up your hand if, if you want to jump in and answer as well. And so, um, David, I'm going to send this one, first of all, your way, but I think that other people might be interested in answering as well. So um, uh, Tristan Norton has asked, so uh, do uh, the panel have any tips um, of the best ways for interested amateurs to approach farmers and landowners to access to survey um, arable plants? So he's found that local landowners um, in his area are initially wary and um, he's also added on what might some of the barriers be to farmers uh, granting access to kind of botanists or ecologists. Um, do you have much experience of that and, and can you uh, see it from a, a farmer's point of view, but also from someone who, who might be happy to offer their help? I'm not sure I'm the best one to answer that, to be honest. I don't know whether, um, you know, like outside of Garrett, I've got direct experience of that. 
Um, I don't mind jumping in on that, Kath. Um, so in the Martindown Farm Cluster that I work with and the one next door, obviously I said earlier that we have a nationally important area for arable flora. So automatically, when, when you talk about really rare species, farmers tend to get a bit nervous about that information getting out there. Um, you know, am I going to suddenly have lots and lots of people descending on me looking for pheasant eye and, and shepherd's needle and all this sort of stuff. But we found that sadly, not that many people actually really care <laughs> um, about these plants. And it's really sad in a way, but good for the farmers and others. Um, in terms of um, going on to farms and, and doing those surveys, um, I think once people realise the reasons for doing that survey, um, they're generally quite receptive, but it's also helpful, as we found in our groups, to have some sort of agreement. We call it a data protocol, um, just to, to set out what happens when a record is made, particularly a rare record, where does it go to, who gets notified, um, and ultimately the farmers are most happy when, when they remain in control of, of that process and, and what happens to that data. So I think, um, you know, good luck with it and, and persevere, because I think personally there's there's no bad thing that can happen from from having more knowledge of what species you have on your farm so um the more farmers realize that and get more comfortable with that the better i butt in um i've been doing surveys on farms since the early 1980s the number of refusals i've had from farmers uh, I, I can count on the fingers of one hand i think um i think that the great thing is that somebody said before is be really enthusiastic. Um, I mean, occasionally you'll come across a grumpy farmer who just says, oh, no, I don't want anybody on my land. But yeah, most of the time, farmers are more than proud of, of what they have and very interested in what you find. Um, sometimes you come across a farmer who will say, oh, well, I don't want you telling natural England because they'll slap an order on my farm. And in terms of arable farms, I think the likelihood of that happening is the likelihood of, you know, walking on Mars or something. Um, you know, there, there are whatever, three, three SSSIs in England for arable land and natural England are distinctly reluctant to, to schedule them. So you can always tell, um, tell the farmer that <laughs> there's absolutely no chance at all. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think, I think show, showing, showing enthusiasm is, is, is the thing. Um, and smiling as well is probably helps a lot. I think I've only ever been uh, confronted once whilst actually doing a survey on a, a, a farmer's land, quite close to you, Henry, actually in Somerset. So, um, uh, but not not your farm, um, a neighbouring one. And it wasn't actually the farmer. The farmer had allowed me access. It was someone else who who very politely asked if I was lost. And I then had to say, no, I'm all right. I, I know exactly where I am. Are you lost? <laughs> um, so, uh, but it was the, the nicest way that he, he turned out to be uh, the father of the farmer. So, yeah. Oh, and another point, actually, um, I think under the Crow Act, if you collect data from the field, any land without the owner's permission, you're not actually allowed to use it. Um, so even if it's an open access land, you have to get permission. And it's always, you know, I think if I was going to walk on a piece of land that's not actually public access, I would always get permission just out of politeness because, you know, it's the best way of putting a farmer's back up is to walk across their land and be caught. You know, I've got land here and if I find somebody walking on it, I'm quite happy for them to do it, but just please ask. Um, that's absolutely fantastic um uh, it's it's now quarter past seven so we're gonna carry on ask a couple more um questions from the chat and i'm gonna throw it open i won't tag anyone sorry david um uh so um uh catherine jones said has asked how can you increase the diversity of arable plants in the field across the farm and across the landscape so natural regeneration um and uh, adjusting nutrient levels or disturbing the seed banks so these are examples of doing it um and em is frantically waving because i think that this also verges on on potential rewilding and things like that as well so uh i know that you could have some examples of that yeah so um 
it, it was interesting actually because I've been dying to get this this anecdote into this session tonight. Um, so it's a great question. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, when I first got into this, I saw a couple of corn marigolds at the corner of a field, and I didn't actually know what they were. I went away. I got Phil's book out and um, found out what they were. Decided that I had to. That's the one, Phil. That's the one. Um, <laughs> decided nice I had to decided I had to um, put a cultivated margin in. And out of sheer curiosity, I went back every year for 17 years. Um, and, and now I wish I'd sort of done a structured longitudinal study. Um, I didn't, but there you go. Um, and actually we discovered a new scarce or declining arable plant species for 13 consecutive years in that margin. Now, I can only suppose, because we didn't know we were starting out to do a study when we started doing it, um, that over that period of time, there were drop-offs in nutrient levels and there were variations in management because essentially the cultivated margin is created in the same way and at the same time, the rest of the field is done every year. So the cultivation techniques and timings and depths follow the rotation. Um, and so having that variability in there, I think has been key in getting the variability into the diversity in that margin. Um, it's been hypothesized by some that the fact I walk through it every year while it's in flower or seed um, spreads these species around. But I mean, I, I don't know if I'm a vector or not there. Um, but essentially I think keeping those, um, keeping margins in, in situ over time, you will actually see changes. And I think it was Jess who mentioned that there was some um, recent research that was actually showing that keeping margins in place over time was a really beneficial thing to do. Um, and I think also that can fit very well with the management. If you're on perhaps a larger farm or you've got multiple staff members, cultivated margins are one of the things that often gets missed because they're not permanently there. And so I've been out to a lot of farms and said, right, I want to see a cultivated margin. And they say, my what? Because they weren't there, they, they weren't a fixed thing, um, and they'd just been rotating around and they'd been missed and drilled over the top of. So I think fixing them is, is really good because it allows you to see that, that drop off. So yeah, that's my story and I've got it in there. Hooray. Um. I'd really like to squeeze this question in before we have to finish, uh, because it's got uh, a lot of, of people. I'm not sure if we're quite qualified to answer it, so I'm going to throw it open. Um, so Peter Sutton has asked, we, we now have the agricultural bill and DEFRA's proposed environmental land management scheme. Does the panel believe that this initiative um, could be effective in delivering a, a step change for farmland biodiversity? including arable plants, but it was, you know, openly about kind of arable wildlife. I really hope so. I have a feeling that there's not a lot known about the new scheme so far, is there? And I think that um, we're all a little bit in the dark. So although we've got the agricultural bill, NELMS is on its way. There's lots of tests and trials going on. Some of them are on arable, some of them on other habitats. I don't think that we actually know enough about what the scheme looks like at all. And I think this is across the board. Um, so I think this is, uh, you know, all of the conservation organisations, all of the farmers who are involved in tests and trials, none of them, you know, that I've spoken with know a lot about it. And, and I think Natural England because the scheme now lies with the Rural Payments Agency. I'm not sure that you guys know either uh, a lot about it and a lot about the detail. So I don't think that we can answer that question. I'm really sorry. Um, uh, but yeah. Oh, Ed, go. Can, can I, yeah, I, um, I, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Um, uh, you, you're absolutely right. Fundamentally, we, we don't know enough. Um, there are a couple of things that I, I feel concerned about at this stage. But one is, I'm not sure that there's going to be uh, sufficient on-farm uh, advisory input face-to-face because -face, um, I, I, I felt the comments in the response on the consultation was pretty lukewarm about that. And, and I think that's absolutely essential. 
Um, and, and secondly, I, I've been asked to take part in a one of the trials for um, a reverse auction process for getting funding for turtle dove conservation. And, and one thing I feel about that is that there's an element of insecurity there. Um, the, the trial is only for a couple of years and maybe in the scheme it would be five years. But if I happen to lo if I happen to start it, get a couple of years funding and then the next year my bid isn't accepted, then what do I do? Um, and, and you can be talking about significant areas of land and uh, yeah, the financial pressures on farming are significant. And, and, and um, so it, it, it seems that there may be a potential for some instability in, in, in um, habitat provision. Um, we have about five minutes left um, before we really hit the, the end of, of our time. Um, I want to ask one more question. It's going to have to be quite a succinct answer. And it's from Nathan Nelson. Uh, he says they're entering countryside stewardship in mid-tier agreement for about 100 hectares and 100 hectares of the farm is going to AB8, um, which they feel is a great opportunity, and it is, um, to allow arable plants to shine. How can we best uh, balance the requirements of AB8 while allowing arable plants to flourish? And how do we avoid the homogeneous one size fits all mixes? And what should we be encouraging on the North Norfolk coast? So this is uh, directly within David and Emily's area. Although, of course, it's natural. You know, I know mid tier schemes don't get any any help. But so the AB8 option, I believe, is the wildflower margin option, not the cultivated margin yeah. option. So there is a there is a conflict in management there. So that's quite an interesting as well that there's that nuance going on. So they might actually be working at odds with one another, arable plants and perennial plants. Yeah, I think it's, I did see that one in the chat and I think it's, um, I, I mean, you are going to struggle to encourage annually, annually germinating plants in what will become a perennial sward under AB8. Um, I know we're very short of time. Um, Kath, I don't know if there's a way of connecting people after this um, event, potentially, but locally we could pick that up if you wanted to. I think that would be um, a really useful thing. And I'm hoping uh, that Mark from Land Management 2.0 is able to capture the chat and perhaps email addresses from that. I'm not sure if, if it works that way because of GDPR and things. Um, but if we can, we'll try and pass those on and also answer some of the other questions that we haven't got round to today. Um, I am going to close it down because um, we've got to nearly half past seven and uh, uh, we've gone on half an hour longer. And so thank you so much for all of the interest. I really, really want to thank, thank all the panellists who've given up their time to come and help um, with us tonight and to be asked really difficult questions to try and answer. Um, and uh, if you would like any more information about uh, what you, in terms of best practice management for arable plants uh, or specifics on certain species, please go and look at the Colour in the Margins webpage. Um, and uh, thank you again for, for joining us and uh, hope that uh, we, you know, we, we do some more for arable plant conservation. I've learnt loads. So uh, thank you to all the panellists too.